Good Thank stuff. fuck. I mean, we're in the audio business. If I wasn't funny, <laughs> oh, but you I mean, you'd be surprised. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> we have had like cool stuff. Well, good morning there, Gareth Cliff, uh, coming in from my hometown of Johannesburg, South Africa. Thanks so much for joining us on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Cool. It's good to be here. Thanks, guys. Yeah, but Great it's stuff. actually. We actually kind of need to like pinch ourselves, you know, just the, the fact that we're chatting to you, um, you know, uh, we've, got, we've obviously listened to you so much of our lives, like on the radio in South Africa. And um, it's uh, thanks to an introduction from Rich Mulholland, who's a legend of a man, and he's also a previous guest on our podcast. So, uh, you right. know, just thanks to Rich for introducing us. Um, how, how do you actually know Rich? Um, Rich and I have met, God, it must be a couple of years ago now, and we've, we've just been in conversation almost constantly since he doesn't that guy does not slow down um, yeah. he's an he's an incredible human and he he seems to have new ideas every other day and we, we actually started when when i began this this cliff central venture five years ago he was one of the people that i wanted on as a regular and we kind of did for about two and a half years we did something called the reality check which you would do on a monday and he'd just talk about stuff that irritated him or stuff that interested him and he kind of just rant um for about five to ten minutes which was terrific <laughs> asking questions and, and people loved it but his travel schedule is so impossible right now that it, it's been very difficult to nail him down for a recording yeah, for yeah. Sure. i can imagine you guys had great conversations because yes. you you're both pretty <laughs> pretty like strong in your thoughts which is uh, which is always important <laughs> one um, way to put it yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so gareth uh, your family has like quite an illustrious history um but but maybe you can kind of take us back to what life was like for little gareth growing up uh, in pretoria south africa um i grew up i was i was my first home was on a farm um, my, my dad farmed for some period in my life, which was terrific. So we, I grew up kind of walking around with chickens and pigs and ducks and horses and all that kind of thing. And, and it was very much a country kind of lifestyle. Um, I, I was alone for the first three years and my brother came along. Um, I don't remember not having him around. And, you know, having a, having a little brother who's only three years younger than you, you that ends up being a best friend. And we had lots of friends, obviously, family people would, would come around. But I, I remember very very happy childhood. I didn't have any of the misery that I read in most people's biographies now where they were <laughs> abused and they had no money and their life was shit. And obviously that for me is a, is a source of some, some privilege. And I, I, I take that quite seriously. I'm, I'm very happy that my parents decided to have me and that they were able to provide a good life for me when I was growing up. But I didn't, certainly didn't feel uh, deprived of anything. And I was happy. There were always people running around with me and having fun. And there were, there were always things to do. I was never bored. I've always been curious about everything in the world, which I think is it's, it's, a, it's a good thing for a kid to be like that. It means that they're probably going to grow up learning a lot and, and participating in a lot. 100%. And look, Pretoria is quite stereotypically quite an Afrikaans area. Do you speak some Afrikaans? Um, I, my, my mother's father's family were Afrikaans and, and quite kind of important in the Afrikaans community in that they, my great-grandmother laid the cornerstone of the Fur Tracker Monument and my great-grandfather was a well-known Afrikaans writer, a guy called Gustav Preller. Um, but, but I didn't really, my parents both spoke English to each other. Most of their friends are English. There were a lot of Afrikaans people in my life, but I did go to an Afrikaans nursery school. Um, and I think that was really helpful because if you learn a language early on in life, you have, you tend to develop an ability for, for other languages. And as a consequence of that, I suppose I pick up quite easily when, yeah. uh, you know, this pronunciation in a certain language, I can speak more or less conversational French, uh, English, Afrikaans. A little bit of Sitswana. Huh. Nice. That's, that's impressive, right? Yeah. Or, like living in Europe, um, I'm always amazed. And like when you also travel and you meet the Europeans and stuff like that, like all of them, are, they're like, you know, I'm, I'm five, six languages. And it's just, yeah. I'm always <laughs> so jealous. I kind of wish, uh, <laughs> wish I could speak more like besides, I guess, English, Afrikaans and, you know, a few words of Zulu. <laughs> I think if you, if, you, if you sort of get the, the one or two, you get the other. And this is the point that I was trying to make with going to an Afrikaans nursery school is that if you're young, and your, your head is still soft, you can absorb all of these things. I mean, I, I watched the most incredible video the other day of a father and his son who has the ability to 
immediately tell you what note he's hearing, musical mm. note. Mm. So oh, yes. you, can either, you can either write out the music and he'll be able to sing it for you. Or if you play something on a keyboard, he'll be able, even a complex note with like eight keys playing at once, what? he can break it down into what they are. Because as a very young child, and perhaps even when he was a baby, his father subjected him to this as you might a language. And when you're a child, mm. you, the language is imprinted on you in notes. That's how you learn. Ah, wow. so you have to start this stuff early. Otherwise, you won't be good at languages. Yeah, that's true. Yes. So much of our programming in, in inverted commas is in that, those early years, including the good programming. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah. Yeah. And, and a lot of people tend to focus on the bad and they tend to be yeah. absorbed in, in what went wrong and how their parents didn't do the best job possible. But parenting is not a zero sum game. I mean, mm. there's, there's no way around it. If, if you end up with good raw materials genetically, that helps, but it's not uh, indicative of, of overall success. And if you end up in a, in a life where there are very few resources and there's conflict and there's a lot of, you know, deprivation and that kind of thing, it's obviously, it's not insurmountable, but it doesn't help. It, it, kids are very fragile things and they take on a lot of good and a lot of bad. Mm. Well, a lot of people that have been through those tough times indeed actually come out for the better. You know, they can use that as fuel for the, for the good stuff. So one way or another, like you say, it's not a zero sum game. So um, just coming back to your ancestry, it, it really is quite fascinating. So, like talking about Gustav Prela and and others, maybe can you just tell us a little bit more about um, about some of them? How much time do you have? I mean, look, <laughs> I always say to people, you're exactly one half your genes and one half your 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 nurture, the way you're raised. Um, and most people know quite a lot about how they were raised and what they had and didn't have and where they went to school and what sorts of influences they had as a, as a child, but the other half of them, they, they're probably oblivious to. Some people don't even know who their grandparents are. And I think that that's, that's not obviously available to everybody because there aren't such great records kept in all parts of the world. But I'm, I'm fortunate in that there, there's quite a lot of family history and I could look it, into it. My brother and sister, by the way, don't care about this stuff at all. <laughs> um, so it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily flow from, you know, your particular family circumstances. But my my father's family are of reasonably interesting origins. My, I think it's four greats grandfather was Lord Charles Somerset, who was the first governor of the Cape. Hmm. Um, ironically, he's credited as being the first guy really to start racial segregation, which is not something I'm proud of. Hmm. Hmm. Um, but he was also the guy who expelled the Afrikaans people from the Cape. So hmm. my mother's father's family then would have probably been on the other side of, of that divide at that Goodness. time. So there's, there's Pete Retief, there's um, hmm. Andres Pretorius. These are, these are well-known South African uh, credentials. So I'm, I'm proud of those. But then they go back quite far into England and Scotland and France as well. Jeez. Yeah. Super fascinating, hey, and like uh, it, it, it is amazing. Like um, I, I saw some stuff that you've you've been on, like on the ancestry website, and there's a whole load of stuff there about your family, <laughs> which is uh, which is. Sometimes you, you know you can find something that's really interesting and that makes it sound like you've got uh, really in, in, in amazing ancestors, and sometimes you, you look at the stuff and it's quite embarrassing. I mean, there are illegitimate children. There are pirates who were hanged. There are people who, 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 you know, went around the world kind of robbing and pillaging and, and conquering. And these are not things that are looked upon fondly by modern day historians. So they tend to look at those kinds of things as imperialist and, and evil. It is what it is. I mean, you can't look at history and judge it by today's standards. Otherwise, we, we're in a losing battle. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, definitely. And and it's it's it is super interesting going back in your own one. Like I I did it a few years ago. Well, I had a like a a great uh, uncle or something reach out to me, and and he he had put together this massive book like on our family history. And I was like, wow, that's that's fascinating. And um, it was just interesting going back. But you've mm -hmm. kind of touched on it already. Obviously, you you've learned a lot about your ancestors, mm -hmm. and you feel that it's important for other people to also actually do it. Um, why, do you, why do you sort of say that? Well, first of all, in South Africa, there, there are a lot of people who, who actually pray to the ancestors. I mean, we've got a, a huge indigenous population whose spiritual beliefs and, and, and background is tied to the ancestors. Now, to me, unless you know something about those ancestors, you're just pretending. 
So that's massively important in, in the okay. South African context. Because if you're going to say that you, that you care about African spirituality, the very least you can do is actually find out something about your particular ancestors. You can't just mm. say, I'm praying to them in general and, and, and hope something good happens to you. That seems like, you know, kind of trying to bet on number three in roulette. And, and yeah. when it comes <laughs> up, you go, oh, well, I've been blessed. Um, the other thing is that, that these are, and we're figuring out more and more about this at the moment, that your genes actually switch on and switch off that you inherit a, a certain uh, cache of things from the people who've come before you. Now, I mean, what's always amazed me about this is that if two people hadn't met in 1632 and hadn't <laughs> had a child at that particular time, I would not be here and many other people in the tree going all the way back would not be here either. So you're, you're actually studying minute details of history, like where someone was born, when they were born, that stuff is, is, is useful. What we're figuring out now, thanks to DNA genome um, rendering and, and the kind of analysis that they can do on someone's uh, you know, DNA structures, the, the chromosomes in their cells, is that you're, you're born with certain talents, certain abilities, your height, your appearance. These things are not changeable. Mm. Um, you, you can't go in and edit them yet in, in the DNA. But there are also things that you can be aware of that are that are potentially quite dangerous. I mean, there's a you know predisposition to Parkinson's disease or to macular degeneration, and these things you can be warned about early on if you have your whole DNA sequenced. And that increasingly, medical aid companies and and health institutes all over the world are paying um, an enormous amount of attention to it because this is the future of medicine, where you actually can edit out these bad things from someone's genome, and they can end up having a much longer, much healthier, much happier life as a direct result of that. That's, that's quite significant. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It is. You yeah. got to go. Sorry, Craig. <laughs> 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 totally. Like, and, 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 you know, the thing is, is that we, we have to also remember off the back of that, that we're not the slaves to those genes either. Like, you know, there's an amazing area of, of study at the moment called epigenetics. Epigenetics are kind of the, the things that happen to genes during a person's life that, that make them change, it's either mutations or it's adaptions, evolution, in fact, to particular purposes. And they've figured out, and this makes perfect sense to me, that if you can store physical, physically important information, like, you know, for example, someone's hair color or eye color in the genes, it would make sense that you could store memories in genes mm -hmm. as well. You could store... Uh, the story of your people in your genes, and we've we figured that this has played a large role in the in in the kind of the thought processes and the the predilections and the the anxiety in, for example, Holocaust survivors and their children and their grandchildren, and in people who were the victims of slavery, for example, and their children and their grandchildren. So it's useful to know the story of your people so that you can at least figure out why you might be doing things a certain way and it's either working or not. I mean, these are useful studies. Yeah, yeah. super useful. We, we actually had um, Bruce Lipton on our podcast, um, who, who's like sort of the godfather of epigenetics or, or at least the modern day version of him. And he, he is super fascinating. He's written this book called Biology of Belief. And mm -hmm. um, you, you should, yeah, he's such an interesting guy when it come, when he talks about, you know, epigenetics and like, did I at least, did I at least explain it reasonably well? Yeah, yes, you did. You did that. Yeah, he'd be happy. There was a, talking about um, good records as well, Gareth, you know, like when, when I lived in Holland, there were a lot of studies with famine because the Dutch had such good uh, records what they did was during the second world war and stuff when the, when parts of the country in, in the Netherlands didn't have any food, then they looked at how that had, has affected two or three generations. Um, hence, uh, and it's quite amazing to see how you can track the people with obesity or these genes that have it now that were based on the people that had this gene or that were uh, subjected to famine. And because the records were so good at white height, weight, all these detailed things, um, that's why it's once again good to know these things because you can sort of change uh, or affect those things and down the track with CRISPR and all these things who knows what 
all bets are going to be off, you know? Now, I interviewed the woman who, who started CRISPR. For, for some reason, her name escapes wow. me now. But what an interesting human being that is. And of course, she then, you know, kind of had to sell the technology on. And she had a company that didn't do so well in the, in the immediate wake of that. Sometimes the people who discover something are not the ones who actually make it a success. But the, the idea of being able to, to send in a piece of code as a marker and to be able to remove some and put some more in. This is, this is the future of, of medicine. And I think everyone is aware of that. Whether we've currently got the capability to actually get there is mm. still a matter of some debate in the scientific community. But this is what's interesting about being alive now. And I think we are the luckiest people that have ever lived. Mm. Uh, and obviously mm. there are probably generations in the future who will, who will look back on us and go, God, those poor things, they were suffering so horribly. <laughs> they had no idea of what the world really was about. And they, they seem so primitive, just like we look at, at past generations and, mm. and we judge them quite harshly. But we are living in a great time. There's, there's less famine. There's less pollution. There's less, I mean, we, there's more forestation happening at the, at the moment than has happened in, in two or 300 years. And I saw the UN report come out the other day. Um, I was astounded by this, that apparently by 2030, and the UN are not well known for sending out signals of optimism. <laughs> they said by 2030, there will not be a single person in the world who will be living under the current poverty line. Uh -huh. So <laughs> the poorest, poorest people right now, $3.70 a day or whatever it is, um, within the next 10 years, there will be no one living that poorly in the world. Sure, so that's, incredible. that's great news. Generally, we're on a very nice upward trend. You know, human progress is a, is a very powerful thing. And we don't stop to take note of that because we're so busy looking at the bad news of the day and what, what's good. going on right now that is a threat to us and, you know, free speech and existentialism and political shenanigans and the vagaries of a currency, for example. These things are all going to matter less and less in the big picture of history. Um, and we're going to look back and, and say that this was a very good time for humans. Yeah, totally, totally agree. People, uh, people do love to focus on those negatives and feel like it's, you know, what about gender, all these things. But like you say, our, our general comfort levels are pretty darn good compared to how they used to be. <laughs> but no, and, um, and I mean, that's, just, that's just top level comfort. But for, for ordinary people, there's less conflict than there's ever been in the world. Yes, exactly. I mean, your, your chances of dying violently as a, as a male are so reduced that it's actually a rarity for someone to die violently. And that's why it ends up in the news. So we watch the news and we see that there were, you know, 300 murders in the African continent today. And we go, oh my God, that's awful. That's got to be, it's getting worse and worse. But actually, compared to the 3,000 murders a day that were happening in Rwanda and Burundi during that conflict, or in the DRC during the time of Leopold, where there were potentially hundreds of thousands of people killed in any given week, um, we really are very, very much more fortunate than any of our ancestors. Yeah, and, and you know what, Garrett? Like, it, it's so it's so great, like speaking to someone like you because you've you've made an effort, right, to understand history, and I think that's so important. And and what lots of people miss out on is like they they kind of just living in like this kind of blasé kind of way, and they don't actually make that effort to understand what it was like in the world back in the day. Because as soon as you start realizing what it was like. You're like, actually, you know what, fuck, I'm actually pretty lucky, like, like you said. Well, this is it. I, I, you know, people used to shit where they ate. They used, to, they used to, to eat horrible things. I mean, most of what they ate was raw, and it wasn't because they were on a keto diet. It was because they, they didn't <laughs> yeah. have access to anything else. Um, you, you, would, you would really suffer from morning till night. It was survival mode. There was no such thing as, as being able to engage in this meaningful discussion or debate. There was no such thing as, as therapy. There was no way for you to try and figure out the purpose of life. And, and those things that were being discovered by brave pioneers and by people who were way ahead of their time, like Newton and, and mm. uh, Descartes and these sorts of people, to me, if you don't study what they were going through with an eye to the context of their times, you have no appreciation for where you are. It's that old idea of, the fish, uh, the old fish swimming in the tank. And he says to the, the next generation of fish, how's the water? And they go, what water? 
because mm-hmm. they don't even appreciate that that's what they're living in. You know, we, yeah. we have a, a generation of, of young people, particularly in the first world now, who have grown up with such a degree of ungratefulness for where they're at, thanks to democracy and liberty and, and freedom and, uh, and, and the ability to express yourself and, and the access to the internet. We've got a generation of people who've grown up thinking all of that has always been there. And they have no appreciation for these very, very massive strides. And, you know, I think it was Newton who said, I stand on the shoulders of giants when he wrote his treaties on, on mathematics. Hmm. This is what we have no appreciation for how everyone has toiled and suffered before us from that first caveman who managed to make a spark of fire through all of the the, the incredible and complex stories of human history to get to where we are now. And for people to, to be complaining right now about, you know, not this, someone's not woke enough or yeah, we, yeah. Don't have, we don't have enough safe spaces is just, it is, it is ungrateful in the extreme, which is why it annoys me so enormously to hear people like that talking. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's fascinating. And even our, our memories are even very short because Second World War is not that long ago. Mm-hmm. And even that feels to me like a distant thing that's, that you yeah. can't really relate to it. So it's very hard for people to, to go back two, three, four hundred years and, uh, and kind well, of get that, that idea. You bring up World War II and, and I've, I've, I thought maybe if I didn't do what I'm doing, the next best thing for me would have been to be a history teacher because I do love it that much. And if you don't learn about your past, you're bound to have some, some mistakes committed in the future, which you could avoid. But to go to World War II, here, both of my grandfathers had to, had to fight the Nazis, right? They actually had no option. They had to put on a uniform, they had to get into airplanes because both, both of them were in the Air Force. And they had to fly over other people shooting them to try and kill them. And they had to try and survive those three to five years that they were in active service. And then they got back and they met my respective grandmothers. And, and all of this might not have happened, but for a bullet. Uh, there might have been some Nazi who was a slightly better shooter who might have taken out one of my grandfathers. And I would not be here having this conversation with you today. And we'd be speaking German if we were. And we would, we would probably be watched by the Gestapo while we were doing it. There certainly wouldn't be podcasts. There wouldn't be the ability to partake in, in free expression and to decide what kind of a breakfast you'd like to have this morning. Those kinds of things we take for granted. And I also get really annoyed when I hear people saying that they, you know, they fought hard for whatever they've got. And we don't even know the, the half of that. I, I struggled to get my grandfather to even talk about World War yeah. II. Mm. because he probably killed people Mm. and that's not easy for anyone to get over and when i did ask him about it he would talk about it in very general terms and he'd say well you know the the other guys and we we were a strong team and we did a lot together and it was never really about him these days Mm. all you hear from people is me 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 Mm. all you hear is I'm struggling, I'm suffering, I don't have enough money, I'm not at the right university, I'm not allowed to study the course that I want, I don't have this and have that and have the other. And again, it's this, it's this ingratitude which grates me so much. Mm. I totally agree. It's, it's massive. We need to watch more Black Adder and, uh, to go back and remember. <laughs> I love Black Adder. <laughs> so Gary, just bringing it back a little bit to, to your story. Um, you've obviously been on the radio and in the entertainment industry for, for a long time now. And um, that interest seemed to begin at school when you used to sit in the back of the car with your brother and sister listening to the radio. Is that right? Mm. Yeah, I, I used to listen to John Burks and, and, and Stan Katz and Gary Edwards and guys like that on 702 in the day. And I had the, the pleasure of eventually meeting my heroes. I didn't know that I wanted to go into radio. Um, I certainly liked radio. Radio was for me a fun place because it's imagination, right? I mean, it tells the story to... A million people and each of them sees a different picture that's very powerful it's something that tv doesn't have something movies don't have books have it people don't read books anymore but <clears throat> but it, it was it was something that, that happened at university really because i needed something to pass by the time while i was in between lectures and um, there was a campus radio station so i, I signed up went in i think i only get, got the job because i could do impersonations and accents 
and and maybe they thought that would that would entertain people but i <laughs> i think that's what what i used to do which was probably the kind of performance in the beginning certainly on campus radio and in the first years of, of working in commercial radio eventually became from performer to entertainer to communicator and then you start to refine that even more and you become an interviewer or you become a listener and and those are those are evolutions in in my journey in radio uh, television's a very different thing tv is, is mostly fake <laughs> that's super true eh? um Gareth, what were you like at school were you I, I don't know i kind of imagine you were like a bit of a naughty little guy just um yeah, yeah, I don't know. Look, it's it's it's. I, I, I wasn't really. Hey, I, I I think what I did was I I managed to occupy a space, a very cool space in between the the bad kids who always broke the rules and got into trouble, and I would sometimes stray into that territory. But also the very good kids who would get the good marks, and the teachers would like them, and you know I became a prefect, whatever that counts for. But I used to, <laughs> I used to, I never would bust anyone for smoking or any of that stuff. So I was. <laughs> I was in with all the the cool kids and I kind of got along with the the jocks and the nerds and I think that's important you have to learn especially as a as a child and and later in your teenage years you have to learn to fit into the crowd that you're in and mm -hmm. this even applied later on in life when I would be you know I was in my in my 30s and doing gigs for 20 somethings in a in a nightclub um and it forced me to to have conversations with people much younger than me. And then I would be attending lectures with people at the, you know, Rand club when they were talking about paleoanthropology. And I'd be, I'd be talking to people in their sixties and seventies and treating them with equal respect and, and appreciating. And it's something I've always tried to do. I don't always get it right, but I've tried to learn something from everyone I engage with in my twenties. I wrote off a lot of people and I thought these people can't really, give me anything in return. So I'll just get through this. But now I've started to realize that actually there, there is something to be learned from everyone. Yeah. 100%. Absolutely. And we, uh, yeah, you go, Greg, sorry. No, we actually just had, um, Art Matthews, well, we're launching with him today. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, um, and that was one of his, his main things. He's like, uh, every single person and interaction in your life is a teacher. And right. if we can, all kind of realize that, you know, we'd probably treat each other a little bit better. Um, if we, if we just understood that, you know, uh, that, that for some reason, this person is here to teach us something. Yeah. I think art is a good example of that because he's really, he, he is immersed himself in culture and, and I, I know he is a very deep and spiritual human being too. Um, a lot of people put on a facade of being like that. They think it makes them look cool and interesting and gives them some gravity, but they've never picked up a book much longer than, you know, 15 pages. Um, and, and it's hard. It's hard to be deep and meaningful and, and intelligent because you should be listening a lot more than you talk. Mm. Mostly you'll find the people who have a lot to say are also the least informed. You have to really ask someone. You have to... People will not volunteer information just for the, the purposes of, of social kudos for cachet um, mm -hmm. if they're really smart. If they're really smart, you have to prize it out of them because they've gone to the trouble of discovering this. Why should they distill it and pass it on to you for free mm. if they've done all the heavy lifting? Totally. Now, listening was something... Uh, that, that, that we all obviously agree on that's so important. Did, did you, by the sounds of it, did you have to cultivate that more, Gareth, like as a, as a skill? Uh, I, I look, I'm not the best at it. I've, I've only recently, and by recently, I mean in the last 10, maybe 15 years, started to develop a, an, an ability to, to listen properly because most of the, the time I was making the most noise. Um, I'm interested in a lot, though. And if you're interested in a lot, you have a certain predisposition to pay attention. I am, I'm, I'm curious about everything. I, I, I want to know as much as possible. I think the, the most happy death I could have is a death where my brain is full, um, where, I've, where I've learned a little bit about everything or even a lot if I'm, like, if I'm lucky. And, and heaven for me would be a time machine where I could go back 
forward and see the the moment of genesis and see the moment of of of, of the assassination of Julius Caesar. And I'm curious about chemistry and I'm curious about physics and I'm curious about architecture and, and art and history and, and, and swords and books. And I mean, if you saw my house, you'd think it belonged to a, a 150 year old. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we lucky though? Isn't it amazing that we can, we can be interested in so many things and, and have access to information on all these things. That, that's, that's one of it. the things that we have, we are so lucky in this time. Well, this, this machine here is the greatest emancipator that's ever been in the hands of any human being. It used to be that it was fire or that it was political power or it was any of those things. But this, this is singularly the most important tool. From rich to poor, it, it, it allows you, it opens up a universe of information and of connection that couldn't have been imagined even 20, 30 years ago. Yeah, it, it, it's actually incredible. I don't think we, we, we give it enough credit, you know, like how amazing it is. Um, just having this thing that we can almost access anybody and any bit of information, um, you know, at the click of a button. It's, it's just yeah. truly remarkable. Yeah. And, how, did, and how, so, did you, how did you guys, how did you guys team up to do this? I'm curious about what, what happened here. That, that <laughs> but it, it is so, so basically we're curious. Yeah, yeah, like, we, <laughs> we, we met up um, through a common friend. Uh, Craig actually used to live in, um, in Holland mm -hmm. and basically uh, we used to like, you know, travel around and stuff like that. And we had a common friend who was going to Ibiza and uh that's how we met we met on the dance floors of ibiza and um <laughs> and basically i'm, I'm hearing because i'm hearing holland i'm hearing ibiza i'm just basically hearing like loads of drug taking and, <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> time. Partying. And, yeah of course absolutely <laughs> isn't that the, the main, we, we that's the main so many south africans want to travel they, they they don't admit that i mean most of them don't care about what the vatican's you know internal <laughs> mosaic <laughs> decoration <laughs> They're really just like, oh, I go to Holland and there's loads of just fun <laughs> partying and drugs and craziness. And so you don't go for the bike riding. No, <laughs> nobody goes anywhere for bike riding. It's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, classic. Yeah. So, so yeah, that, that's how it started. But, and then, well, that's how we met. And then actually, um, we carried on meeting each other, like in different places around Europe and, you know, mixing a little bit of culture with a little bit of like, you know, bar crawls and these sort of things and then one day we were in, in Madrid in a bar crawl and um, we basically were just having these amazing conversations and we we're like yes these are such cool conversations I'm sure other people would be interested in them you know like surely they would be like they would talk about the same sort of things or, or whatever and then we were like we should start a podcast and then and then it wasn't I guess the right time but three years later I had left my job because I was I used to work in the city in London um, Craig had moved to Australia and then we were like, cool, let's just go. And we did it. And, and this is, this has been, yeah. And coincidentally, an that conversation was also largely based on our grandfathers, as you were mentioning, Gareth, like we were just like, I know my grandfather had done, gone through this, been through this. These are the stories he used to tell me. And, and Gareth and I were sharing these stories with one another. And, and that is what really sparked us. We were like, yeah. we should be documenting history when we mm. speak to these people. Um, because stories are the things that lit us up. And I think that's what, that's, that's the cool thing about information is that it's stored in someone's head that has been filtered. As you mentioned, Gareth, there's this heavy lifting of life, you know, like the, 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 this, this filter that you've been through that you that becomes your life is an amazing story. Everybody's. And I think that's what we, we want to like package up a little bit and, and, and for posterity. And, and coincidentally, when we interviewed each other, um, we realize, and our, some of our friends, you realize when you sit down and listen for an hour and a half or however long, you, you, you gain so much information about the people around you that you never even knew. And so listening really is a superpower. That's, that's very well put. <laughs> so, um, Gareth, in um, 98, um, you and your mate, um, John Kuhn, um, set up uh, the first ever student portal in South Africa for, for South African students. Um, and in 2003, uh, John unfortunately uh, passed away from a heart attack. Um, yeah. It must have been a um, massive, massively tough time for you. Well, no, I mean, we weren't the best of friends, but we'd worked together a little bit. And he was, a, he was one of those people who just uh, 
had a, a, a range of talents and abilities, and he was a hard worker and he was driven as all hell. And we started this website, which I, I'm going to make a big claim here and say that it was kind of a, a proto Facebook in a way, because by you know 1999, there was no there was no idea around what was going on on the internet. The internet was very new and nascent, and you know people would kind of they just figured out how to start having chats on online, and mm -hmm. even those were just rudimentary at best. And we developed a, a student portal effectively, where we, were, we would go from campus to campus and set up almost an internal student communications platform. And this, is, this predates Mark Zuckerberg by some years. Um, the, the reason it never really took off, because we had it and there was content being put on and we, we employed a team. It was this interesting uh, sort of overlap of, of what was traditional news and information and journalism and study guides and that kind of thing with what the internet would eventually become. So it was, there was a lot of foresight involved there. I don't know how much of it we can take credit for or whether or not we were just paying attention to what was going on around us. But it was something I'm, I'm immensely proud of in retrospect. It never made us any money because the bubble burst on the internet. And we were in really serious conversations with a pretty big investor at the time. Because of the bubble bursting, it, it just became a nothing. And we, we just all let it go. But we did buy out two of our other partners. And it cost us some money, which to me would show that we were prepared to pay for the idea, even at that early stage. We saw the value in it. And it wasn't just a vanity project either. The fact that we had to pay out these other two guys to leave it alone so we could carry it on was a lot for a 19, 20-year-old to take on. And, yeah. and I, was very, I was very proud of where we were at the stage. Um, certainly, the, the pioneering continued for some time after that. John had a, had a heart condition, which nobody knew about. Hmm. And he was president of the Wits SRC. He was a Rhodes Scholar. So he was a, an immensely talented human being. Um, and, and yes, it was, it was shocking to lose someone in their 20s. You can imagine. That's, yes. that's just it's, you know, unnatural these days for people to to not identify a problem like that and, and have, it, have it dealt with fairly quickly. Yeah, especially like a heart attack. I mean, for a youngster, 24 is like almost yeah. unheard of, isn't it? Um, yeah. yeah, so is it, I was checking out the, the website actually because it, it's still live. I'm not sure it's if it's actually... I'm, I'm, not sure if it, I'm not sure if it's the same one or not, but it's cool. Because like, you mentioned that you, you, know, you, you supplied games and things like that for them. And I saw Pac-Man. I was like, wow, man. Uh, listen, we made, it into, we made it into Time Magazine. Wow. International Time Magazine as a little website in South Africa. And this is why I say it had potential yeah. to be enormous. It could easily have been the next, the first Facebook, the first LinkedIn in some ways for students. Um, the timing is everything, huh? It totally is, but uh, yeah. And I was actually literally saying that to my missus last night. I was like, this guy, if you think about it, he actually started the first Facebook. Literally, like, you know, that's kind of, that's exactly what Zuckerberg yeah, did, didn't he? Yeah, it's a big claim. I'm not going to say that I can justifiably prove that, that I would have been able to do that. And <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, in, it's, in the, it's in the history books. It's, it's archived on the internet. I don't know if people will one day look at it and go, okay, these guys were quite sharp. Okay. It, is, it is interesting to, to do the mental sort of experiment or the thought experiment of like, if you had that injection of cash, yeah. what would have happened? You know? Well, I mean, we would have, what we would have, probably, we would have been able to go international, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Wow, bud. Well, anyway, things happen for a reason in life, that's for sure. And um, yeah. Thanks. You're making, really making me feel better about it. <laughs> I, I only got over it about 10 years ago and now yes. you bring it up again. Yeah, sorry, let's, but let's we have a bad habit on that. Of that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Oh, classic, man. So, so, but talking about things happening, like at 23 years old, uh, basically upsteps this bright-eyed, bushy-tailed young man and, and takes over the seat to probably kind of the most famous radio host at the time in South Africa, John Burks. And, you know, what, what did that feel like for you? And, and were there kind of nerves on the day? Yeah, I, I remember I used to be quite self-destructive though in those days because I thought I'd already figured it out. I thought talent was enough. And I think the first morning, or it could have been in the first week of my shows, I actually had a like bumper bashing on my way into work. And so I was late for one of my first shows, which was, you know, it's the kind of thing that you, you it's, it's almost the universe giving you a message. 
but I, I was I was kind of out of control in those days. I did a lot of stuff for shock value. Mm -hmm. There was also there was a there was a, a degree of you know I was talking to people my parents' age, so it wasn't a natural. I wasn't talking to to peers. I had to up my game substantially to be able to talk. And remember, seven hundred two had already had a very proud and 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 varied history and and responsibility for for helping south africa through some very interesting times mm -hmm. so there was there was an enormous amount of, of pressure but i had in rena brumberg who's remained my business partner since then she was my manager at the time um, i had in her a, a resource which i don't think a lot of broadcasters or people in any talent any sphere any industry have she's almost like a live-in psychologist and therapist, and also someone who really has got my back, so I can trust her implicitly. And she helped me with those, those initial very unsteady steps, but I, I thought I knew it all. So if you listened to any of it then, you would have thought, who is the smart ass who thinks he's got all the answers? Mm -hmm. he's, uh, he's rude to people, uh, he, he says inappropriate things, he's not afraid of being politically incorrect. Um, and at that stage, that might have taken some people by surprise and therefore might have in, engendered in them some kind of curiosity around me, which is fine as long as they listened. <laughs> Fully. Sometimes um, being a little bit polarizing uh, is, a, is a good thing in life, you know, and uh, I guess you certainly had that as a, as a brash youngster. But how, how did the listeners take to you and, and what were some of the other sort of challenges, challenges that you had faced at the time? Look, I think a part of it must have been just blissful ignorance that I didn't realize that there were hundreds of thousands of people listening to me and that I could have been in serious trouble if I said certain things. Mm. I'm exactly like you asked me about what kind of person I was at school. I'm half and half on the fence of not giving a damn what people think of me, which I think has been a, a, a strength, but also really caring what people think about me. And I don't know which one outweighs which because they swap positions. I mean, sometimes I just really couldn't give a shit if everybody in the world thought I was the worst person that had ever lived. And at other times, I'm, it really it bothers me when people don't like me because I might not have deserved their ire. So I don't know. You, you, you vacillate between the two. And mostly, I think, what we were doing in those days was experimenting. I was certainly experimenting. So you dip your toe in it and see how that works. And if it works, you do it again. And you keep pushing the envelope. And you've got to remember, South Africa in the early 2000s was still a place trying to figure out what it, what it was. Uh, what does it mean to be South African? What does it mean to, to have emerged from this, this extraordinary history and this very painful and difficult history? And to get people talking, and, and to entrust some 20 something with that is it was brave of Rena. Forget about me. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember, I remember like, cause I'd actually left South Africa at that time and I would come home on the holidays and, and my folks were massive 702 fans and they were like, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's this new guy on in the mornings, and he's uh, oh. yeah, they're like, they're like in the household, <laughs> like you know, one person would be like, you know, he's he's cool and he's good because he creates, you know, conversation, and this is important. The other one would be like, nah, this, okay, you know, he's just <laughs> <laughs> too opinionated, whatever. Oh, wow. So, but but it's but it's I think it's important though, but do you know what I mean? Like it, it's important to have an opinion and to 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 talk about things because. I don't know. We just hide behind so much in life, you know, and, and don't talk about difficult things. Well, I remember, you know, talking about race has always been interesting for me because we used to make fun of this. I, I had uh, Tabo and Mabali who were black and I had Leanne and CS who were white. And we would talk, this is now in 5FM in, in that mm. team arrangement. And we would talk very openly about things. And we'd, we'd say, you know, the thing that irritates us about whites or the thing that bothers us about blacks is. And that was very um, controversial at the time. And now, in retrospect, it's even more controversial because it's so politically incorrect. Um, you, you can only judge conversations in the context of their own time. Mm. And the problem with Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat and YouTube, frankly, is that if you look at them outside of the context of their time, they can seem completely inappropriate. And this is for some people, it's an ugly weapon with which you bludgeon. And I see this happen to, you know, some 
there's a Chinese girl who put together a script for a, a story about uh, indentured laborers in Asia. And she wanted funding and people gave her funding and she was launching it and she'd written a script and some guy got hold of the script and said, you can't talk about slavery because you're a Chinese girl. And it turned into this ugly situation. It was very well publicized. This is probably about four years ago. It turned into this ugly situation where she actually begged the publishers to withdraw and it's never been published and she's never made her, her movie. And, and if you look her up, the first thing you will find if you Google her is that she was a racist. I mean, mm -hmm. this is just not fair in any way. And for that to be your epitaph, for that to be the singular thing that people who don't know you first find out about you is just outrageous. Mm -hmm. and this is the, for, for young people, we talk about the struggles of the past and our grandfathers having to fight in a war and all that stuff. But really the struggle for generations going forward is going to be to be able to introduce themselves in a, in a world where you can either stand up and be proud for your creative efforts and for what you are, what you believe in and, and where you stand on things and take the criticism, whether you like it or not, and whether they like it or not, or to try to fit in to the degree where you actually lose yourself and you become a blank page that anyone can write whatever they want on. This is going to be the challenge of people who are much younger than us and, and those generations still to come. Fully. I think that's that's part of the problem though, exactly what you said. Part of the times now is that if you do say the wrong thing, you actually can have repercussions that give you a stigma for the rest of your life that, that there is no humanly possible way to apologize for. Yeah, in, I mean, this you know is I mean? This, you, you so you're so right. You're so right. And this is the problem, I think, for so many people now in, in the world of, of changing world of media is, and, and part of what has made me you know, the, 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 the pioneer of what we've done in podcasting in South Africa is also this desire to be my own boss and to be unfireable because I don't want these woke scolds and these people who are, they're nobodies. They got a couple of hundred followers on Twitter and can whip up some controversy. I don't want those people trying to get me fired like they've got so many other people yeah. fired. I refuse to be a victim. I've never liked the idea of it. And I think that it is extremely calculating, cold and vicious, the way that people go after each other on social media. And I'm not going to allow anybody to get a handle on me, which is why I'm now my own boss. You can't fire me. I'm responsible to myself and to my audience only. It's a very honest relationship. Mm -hmm. and that is, that's something I care about far more than the millions of people I might've had access to if I were still on radio or television. I'm not interested in that. Been there done that well yeah. a massive kudos to you man i think it's a it's a it's really an exemplary thing that you've done i, I reckon well thanks i mean podcasting has been around for much longer than me but it was a natural place to develop the next evolution of what we were doing on on radio and in broadcasting generally i think that audiences are now in a position where they can choose whatever they want they can listen to you guys they can watch movies and videos on youtube about you know, how to, how to tie shells together into a necklace. It's entire, you can do whatever you want these days. And I think that that is, that is freedom at work. And I love it. I think that the internet is the most tremendous tool and we mustn't overlook all its good things. Just like we mustn't look at all of history and imagine that all of it was bad yeah. or the tremendous strides that it has given us in a very short time. I mean, the amount of, of development and discovery and innovation that's taking place now and the accelerated rate at which that's taking place is unspeakable by comparison with any other period in, in human or any other animal's evolution. We're, we're adapting on the truck. We're dancing on a moving carpet right now. <laughs> the, the things that will happen tomorrow are more unpredictable than the things that could have happened at any other day in human history before us. Yeah, man. Jesus, it's a, such an exciting time. And, and like you said, I guess it's, it's people not being grateful for, for what it is. And uh, we, we need to really just, you know, be thankful for, for this time we're living in. And, and you know, like you said, like uh, you, you have literally access to whatever it is you want. My yeah. and I, we're going traveling soon. And we're like, we've just been watching, you know, people on, on YouTube about, okay, cool. This is what you do in, in this country and this country and this right. country. And it's just like, 
wow, how amazing is that? You know, see you later, but, lonely but, planets. And <laughs> but even, even if you didn't have the ability to travel, if you have a phone now, you, you can put yourself inside of a, 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 an 800 year old sure. church or in the cradle of humankind where there are fossils of, of hominids that go back millions of years. You, you can look this stuff. You can go to the place on Google Earth, for heaven's sake, and feel like mm. you've been. That wasn't possible. I had to imagine when I was a child what New York City looked like. Totally. I had to, I had to picture the avenues. I used to draw pictures of the skyscrapers. Uh, it was something I would one day do if I was lucky. But there was no resource other than books for me to look for this stuff. I used to read National Geographic magazine from cover to cover. I know things about places in Indonesia, which... I would never have known if it wasn't for those. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. And, and you've kind of like preempted, I guess, what I was going to ask you. But like, just uh, speaking to Rich Mulholland, um, I, I, we always like to ask, uh, you know, previous guests uh, if they've got any questions and stuff. And um, he, he basically, when I said, when I said, obviously, you know, he introduced us, and then I was like, "Do you have a question?" He's like, "Well, first of all, um, I want to say that." Uh, he, you as in gareth is the smartest one of the smartest human beings he has ever met who knows a lot of shit about a lot of shit <laughs> uh, that's uh, that's typical rich speak um so but so you mentioned like uh, national geographic and being curious but like how else were you have you <coughs> developed and and did you develop even in the early days this vast array of knowledge i get obsessed about little things for an, for a short period of time i mean short you know, it might, might last longer for certain things. Music has lasted a very long time. History's lasted a very long time. Architecture and art and, and chemistry have lasted a long time. Some of these things are things that you just develop a curiosity for suddenly. And then you get, before you know it, you're down the rabbit hole and you're figuring out how many electrons there are in the outer shell of a fluorine atom. And it fascinates <laughs> you that fluorine can combine with every other element including the noble gases. And then you want to know about the noble gases and then you want to find out about electron negativity. Before you know it, you're essentially studying stuff that's at master's level. But mm. I want to know more than the average chemistry master's student because I'm not doing it because my parents are paying for me to do the degree. And I'm not doing it because I need to get the degree because I want a job. I'm doing it because I am fascinated by it. It is the most pure motivation that there is. So I've built a laboratory at home. I have a chemical, I have a chemical laboratory, at home. It's an inorganic chemistry lab. It's wacky. I don't show a lot of people because it freaks some of them out. You can't just take some, <laughs> come up and see my lab. You know, my meth lab. <laughs> well, that immediately they jump to the conclusion yeah. that either it's a meth lab, which, yeah. which I, I wouldn't know how to do organic chemistry, which is what meth falls into if I tried. Yeah. I'm not that interested in it. Most of organic chemistry is about learning very complex names and they keep changing the nomenclature. So it's very hard to figure out what substances you're actually dealing with if you're an mm -hmm. organic chemist. Whereas inorganic chemistry is about the recipe book of God. I mean, this is not fucking around. I, I have in, in my laboratory a sample of every element it is possible to have <laughs> that, is, that is not illegal or so rare that you can't find enough of it. Mm -hmm. um, all the way from hydrogen right through to uranium. And no what, what a, this is what this is if there is a God, these are the substances that he uses to make everything, including the organic chemicals, because those all come from carbon. And I will sit in there and I will be as fascinated with that stuff as I am in talking to you guys now. And you won't hear from me for four days while I'm busy. <laughs> it could be the most boring, uninteresting looking experiment that there ever is, like a like a titration where you you neutralize an acid with a base. I mean, it's not, that's not interesting to watch, right? It doesn't, nothing happens. But to do it myself with my own equipment in my own laboratory, in my own time, it's just, this is something I've dreamt about since I was 13 years old. If I want to know about Charlemagne, I, I, I could have read other people's books and gone to libraries when I was a kid, and now there's the internet. But now I own a volume of three books that are about the descendants of Charlemagne, which mm. are rare books to find. You, you, you won't find them on eBay. They, they're very hard to source. To have those things around me and refer to them whenever I want, that is the, the most privileged thing I could imagine for my own life. 
to, to live in blissful ignorance, like so many people do, where things just keep happening to them and they're not sure why. Mm. They're not even curious about how. They, 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 they use a phone, but they don't really want to. I mean, there's a, there's a, a gyro in here that enables it to figure out whether it's up, down, left, right, that can do the facial recognition stuff, that when you lift it means it switches on. That, that is such complex technology that the only place it really in, it was found prior to the space age was maybe in early aircraft. And, and, and this thing can tell you what your GPS is. Now, this is a massive, massive deal. How can you pick this up or worse, buy it from some cheap retailer and not have questions about how it works. How can you only be interested in going onto Facebook so you can see your friend's pictures when there's a universe of other stuff available to you? This is puerile. This is, this is why there are some humans who are organs. They, they're organisms. They, they, they eat, they sleep, they shit, they wake up, they eat, they sleep, they shit, they wake up. That's all they do. And, and to me, that is such a waste of a life. There are people, people I know who live like that and, and they don't seem to think this is important. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, a lot of the greats in history, you just made me think of that now is like, we're, we're, we're dabbling with alchemy and these things. And, uh, and, and it's, and I can just picture you there, there just yeah. like, you know, it's a, it's a scientist. yeah, but it's, it's brilliant. I think it is, it's, to, it harks back to your curiosity. Um, but, but I also just thinking about it, like Sam Harris in, in one of his things, he talks about, um, if we went back, uh, everything is done with massive complexity, like the phone, like if, if any, hmm. if you could just, if you went back 200 years now and you were dropped in the middle of, you know, on your own in the forest, would you be able to make a needle and thread <coughs> just to make some clothes? And it's the most, literally the most simple thing ever. But would you be able to do it? Probably not. And then you think of a phone. And so that's when that curiosity can start to kick in. You think how incredible it all is. Well, again, uh, uh, this seems to be a theme that we're going back to, and it wasn't my intention. But there's this ingratitude. Like, you know, you pick up a phone, um, and, and suddenly there's this, this enormous potential in your hands. But you, you just you go, oh, well, I don't have the best I don't have an iPhone X. Obviously, this is rubbish. <laughs> I mean, someone in, in 1990 would have given their left ball for a Nokia 3310. Yes, <laughs> tell me about it. <laughs> but uh, but it's, so, it's, it's, it's super, super interesting what you're saying, and this curiosity is amazing. And, and I saw this week you had um, uh, Dr. John Martini on uh, your, your show yeah. and, and, and we, we had him on a, a while ago too. And he, he's like, in terms of curiosity, he's an, a yeah. fascinating yes. guy to speak to, isn't yeah. he? And like exactly what you said, you know, he's just gone and learned everything possible and then sort of teaches other people off the back of that. Um, yeah. Like what, 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 how was the chat with him? I didn't, I haven't actually heard it. But it was... no, he's great. I mean, I've spoken to him a couple of times and you know, he, he has a, a business here in South Africa and he, he does these talks and, I think he's very instructive and helpful to people who we've got to remember some people just were not raised with the basics. They were not, yeah. they were not taught how the economy works. They were not taught how free expression works. They were not, nobody's ever sat them down and helped them with these basic things. Like motivation is to me such a stupid idea because <laughs> if you aren't motivated, no one else is going to be able to motivate you. You know, George Carlin, the famous comedian used to say, if you want self help, Help yourself. I mean, <laughs> like that. And Dr. John Demartini, a, he's a smart guy. He's made a, a, a fortune out of, out of giving people basic information. It's, it's not rocket science. He's not busy discovering what's on the frontiers of, of, of um, human behavior, but he has yeah, figured seismology. Out. <laughs> yeah, he, he has. Well, I mean, he talked a little bit about, on, on, uh, which I got confused by because I frankly don't know that it's very accurate. This idea that the sun has an influence the seismic activity within the sun has an influence on our behavior. That's, that's a stretch. That's like saying if you're born Virgo, you behave a certain way. <laughs> Capricorn behaves differently. I'm not sure I, I buy into that. And there's, there's a paucity of evidence to indicate that he would have the requisite um, material to be able to prove that thesis. But yeah. he has certainly got you know, enormous amounts of, of uh, 
experience in human behavior, in, mm. in the way that money works and the transfer of energy and value from one person to another. And from that point of view, I think he has a lot of value to add to my audience. And, and, and I sometimes, you know, will listen to something after I've done an interview and go, wow, that guest actually said something really remarkable there um, that might or might not have been a response to a question, but that you only hear upon the second listen. Hmm. He's yeah, one yeah, of those great. guys. He's, he's definitely got something to say. And, and I think it's, it's useful stuff. Definitely. hundred percent. Now you, Gareth, you briefly touched on it there. Um, uh, freedom of expression. And you've obviously been outspoken over the years and, and you say sort of, it's the most important human right. And uh, maybe you can just tell us a little bit more about why, you know, uh, it's so important to ha to, to sort of uh, embrace that and, um, and uh, yeah, and have the trolls sort of change some of your thoughts on all of that. No, 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 no. <laughs> I don't, I had um, Helen Ziller on last week and she said she just doesn't care about the trolls at all. And I've got to agree with her. One thing, I mean, I, I had to take Mnet to court for not honoring a contract that we had because they were so scared of the trolls and I won and I had to be put back on idols and I'm proud of that, but I had to stand up to these people and to remind them that it doesn't matter how much noise you make. You know, again, uh, I think you guys, referred to this as well, but Ricky Gervais said uh, famously in an interview not so long ago that if you walk past a homeless person covered in shit in a garbage bin and they started shouting at you, calling you a cunt or whatever, you just ignore them because they're unimportant in your life and they don't need to hold you back. And that's exactly how we should treat anonymous and even some people with a blue tick on them, frankly, on Twitter <laughs> or Twitter or Instagram or anywhere else. I mean, just put them in their place. They're not important. They don't, they don't change your mind. Free expression is the beginning of everything. Without free expression, if you live in an environment where you can't say what you really think or do what you say, you can also not have integrity. Those two go together to me. They're, they're, they're a similar thing. Why so many people are content to abdicate that to someone else is beyond me. I think deep down inside, we all have a need to express ourselves and a need to hear what other people are expressing. And the, the important side note to free expression, which was articulated best by Christopher Hitchens, was that it's not so much about you being able to say what you want to say, but about you being able to hear even the things that you regard as unpleasant, untrue, mm. offensive, contradictory, and difficult so that you can either improve your own argument or learn new information, change your decision, change your point of view. Isn't that the purpose of learning? Isn't that what an intelligent person should do? Yeah. I literally couldn't agree more. Like, you know, you have to, you literally have to take a step back sometimes and just be an observer, you know, and understand that there are all these different perspectives. Look, not all of them you need to sort of take on board, but you can just learn from kind of like these trolls and whatever. And so even, yeah, even a stupid, ignorant person should be allowed to be stupid and ignorant. Yes. They oh, should be judged we, how, on that. How are we going to know what we're dealing with? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's always interesting, like, you know how they say, oh, you've got to surround yourself with, you know, like people that are, you know, going to push you and, and, uh, similar to you and these sort of things. And I also think it's important to surround yourself with other people who are not like that, because then at least you have, you know, some sort of uh, marker where to measure yourself from and, and understanding that like, you know, actually, um, you know, uh, I, I'm not sort of that bad sort of thing. Like, so um, it's surrounding yourself with so many different types of people, I think. Um, is actually well, important. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is just, again, back to the curiosity thing. If you, if you are in a room with people who all agree with you, you're in the wrong room. Mm -hmm. um, there, there is no conversation that's better than a heated argument. None. Uh, you can be in, in, in that love stage with a prospective partner and you're both finding out about each other. And that's, that's, you know, titillating and, and, and it's exciting and all of those things. But there is no better interaction, I think, than to argue with someone whose opinions you take seriously. Mm. It seems to me that that is the highest compliment in conversation you can pay to someone. To say to them, I'm going to listen to this idea which I find unacceptable or that I, I disagree with strongly 
or that you have no evidence for. And I'm going to take it seriously, that's respect, until I can figure out a way to argue it effectively and change your mind. And they're trying to do the same to you. To invest that amount of time in a person in a conversation is the greatest compliment you can pay to someone. So people need to argue more, not less, but they need to argue constructively and substantially, not just from feelings. Feelings have become the ultimate retreat to which people hasten mm. when they run out of good arguments. Yeah. And good faith. Like I think if you're having a, you don't always have to have it in bad faith and argument. You, you well, can, there are ground rules that you can achieve to have a, a successful argument without it being no something to be scared of. Why would you engage with someone whom you've already assumed has bad motives? If, if I thought that you were horrible people and that there was no real value to be achieved between me and you in terms of what I could learn from you and what you could learn from me, and I thought you were, you were inherently morally deplorable creatures, why on earth would I be stupid enough to agree to talk to you? What, what's the, what is the best outcome of that? That I will lower myself, that I will devalue and debase myself. It seems to me that that's a terrible place to start. And so if you go on the internet and you assume other people's bad motives, then why engage with them? You're going to debase yourself. It's a, it's, it's a very unvirtuous cycle. Mm. But I think it's a fine line though, because you, you, you you can also get the wrong signals from someone and you might not engage with them based on that signal you've received. And you could in that way, maybe miss out on a really great conversation because you, can you, can you give me an example? Um, well, I think you, through social media, you might like say an interview, someone might say you should interview X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And you, then you hear, oh, but I've heard he's a, a racist or whatever. And then you say, oh, well, I'm not going to, we're not going to definitely chat to that guy. But when you actually go and look into his story or whatever it is, maybe it's got nothing to do with race. And you then have turned down that story. I don't have a direct example of one off the top of my head, but yeah. I feel like, look, what I is can, the, I can, I can think of some, I can think of some very unpleasant people who I'd rather not engage with because I don't think there's much to be gained from it. I think that there are people who are out there with bad motives. But to assume that based on zero evidence, or worse, to assume that based on someone's race, class, gender, I mean, that's the essence of, of bigotry, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And that's a terrible place to start. Um, so yes, there, there are probably bad actors. There are people who have ulterior motives and who are, are coming from a potentially malevolent, wicked place. But you can quite easily unfollow them disengage from conversation when you see them in public avoid them. i think that's yeah. that's probably meant that's quite a healthy psychological way to go about things totally. i think i think it's a it's such a good important skill to learn um to to have conversations and and debates and things like that and i, I like i hope one day at school like you always remember back in school the debating team was, <laughs> was kind of just the nerds and it was like five people and then, you know, but everyone else is like playing sports and these sort of things. I really yeah. hope like the future is going to be like, yeah, cool. The debating team is like, there's a hundred people in the debating team sort of thing like that, because it's such an important thing to help us with the future. Yeah. And there are very smart people. Um, you know, this country is, we're always hearing the bad stories about how shitty our education system is. And we've just launched a brilliant podcast series um, with uh, an organization called Simong and one of the major banks I mean, I'll give them credit, it's ABSA. And what they've done is they've sponsored a series of debates, precisely the kind that you're talking about. Now, where the smartest kids from all the schools and universities around South Africa get into a room and they actually show us how clever they are. They show off how brilliant they are, how much research they've done. They articulate a point that they might not personally believe, hmm. which is really a champion purpose hmm. of debating. If you can argue the other side's position, and if you've heard a good argument from the other side, you may engage in a debate with some utility. If you haven't done that, I mean, I, this, it's always the most blatantly uninteresting thing when you hear someone and they talk and you can tell immediately they've never heard a good <laughs> argument. 
against that position. And it, you, you know there's nothing to be gained from this. Is yeah, that yeah. relating to steel manning, like where you, when in a debate where you can argue someone else's point as well as they can and then sort of well, come back with something else? One of the rules of debating, the, the, uh, the opposite of that is obviously straw manning, where you yeah. put up the most facile argument against your position so that you can just destroy it like a straw man. Mm -hmm. So steel manning is, uh, it's odd that that's even come up as a, as a means of describing it, that we needed to describe a steel man because of a straw man because effectively all debating, it doesn't take any cognizance or heed of your original point of view or your position on a matter. If you are a good debater, you are given a subject and you're given a side, and sometimes it's not your side. If I were a, a pro-Palestinian uh, um, you know, activist for the PLO, and I was told to argue for Israel's existence, and I couldn't, I would not be allowed to debate. You have to be able to do that. Now, the fact is, many people who engage in daily discussions, debates, arguments, and noise are not in a position to defend the opposite side's point of view because they've never actually read any material or exposed themselves to any ideas from that side. So it's a, it's a, it's a very dangerous place to then proclaim that you have a certain point of view from. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And it's so funny, like, I, you know, I guess you can kind of go down rabbit holes and, and check a lot of things online. And I, I must roll my eyes like 50 times a day when you see some of the arguments that are going on there. And you're like, well, you, you clearly have no clue about what you're talking about, but you're just going to carry on arguing. It's just like, anyway, it can be fr quite frustrating sometimes. Oh, <laughs> but um, but but Gareth, going back a little bit to your story. Uh, so so for 10 years, you were the host of the kind of the biggest commercial morning a radio show uh, on 5FM. Um, maybe you can just sort of kind of tell us a little bit, what, what is a day like and like, how do you prepare for the shows? Um, yeah. Um, well, I'm still living in that, that routine, which means getting up at 4.30 in the morning, which is very unpleasant, no matter where, you know, how much passion you have for something. You never wake up at 4.30 and go, I'm loving this. <laughs> but it is nice to start your day before everyone else. And it is nice to be able to help other people start their day. And that's why morning radio is still the only kind of radio that I'm interested in. Um, and then I had a team of, of people who I'm still friendly with. I had Damon on my Cliff Central show this morning. I had Leanne on yesterday. My valley's coming in next week. So I speak to these people regularly, even though they're not all in my life every day like they used to be. But they become a satellite family. You You spend three hours with the same people five days a week. And it's three hours where we're actually concentrating on what the other people are saying. That's more than most happy marriages yeah. get in terms of quality time. If you get an hour with your wife after you get home after a long day, you would consider that very valuable time and you would consider yourself fortunate to have it. And here we were, we were a group of people who got together and we not only had ourselves as this satellite family, but our audience, and there were regulars who would call in. There were people who would, for the first time, give us a, you know, an indication that they'd been listening. And that was very special. But, you know, after doing <clears throat> the morning show for seven years and doing commercial radio at 5 FM for 10, it was time for a change. So how much do you actually, like, prepare for a show? Because I think this is also what people maybe don't quite understand. Like, I, I don't know if you, I'm sure you did prepare a lot for, for each one, um, you know, it, or, or was it not like oh, that? <laughs> no, I, you know, life is preparation. Yeah. You never, when you're with your friends, you don't run out of things to say. Mm. Um, so that's an obvious one. There, there were things in the news. There were things in my life and in other people's lives. There's stuff that's on TV. There's always stuff to talk about. And you fall back in those things when you don't have something really interesting or funny or clever or useful to throw in. Um, but no, it wasn't a, it wasn't a hardcore prep situation. Life is the preparation. Um, having said that, when I was at 702, I used to have to do a lot of reading in terms of government white papers on agriculture and, and shit that I really didn't care about. <laughs> Just so that I could ask the right question of a government spokesperson. Um, and, and that was not my scene. So no, I'm not, I'm not a natural over preparer. Mm, cool. <laughs> I used to listen to your show every day as well on the way to, to university and things. And the cool thing is you really do, as you mentioned, feel like you're part of a family. You wake up, you're part of the team. There would be running jokes over like 
two weeks sometimes, you know, you, 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 or longer sometimes. And, and then that's just, such a great thing. You, you really do get to um, influence a lot of people's day for the better um, by just Thank you. being very normal and very sort of like a family would, you'd have a laugh, you'd have a, you'd have a stab at someone else. And, and these are just things to remember that, uh, that we can do day to day to just have a better day. You know? Well, thank you, because I've also had to learn to take a compliment. And I really do appreciate that. That's, that's a very nice thing of you to say. It, it didn't always feel like we were doing something important. Sometimes it just felt like we were making people laugh in the traffic. Sometimes it felt like it was just a job. But when I hear things like this, it makes me feel good. So thanks. Yeah, pleasure. And I think you, because all of you guys were so are, are articulate, you would you wouldn't only be making people laugh. In between that, you would be making people think. And I think you know that's that's really the essence of it. And uh, yeah, so so there's a lot lot of, lot to it. But talking about um, uh, you know some of your quotes, you obviously we've we, we've heard you so much on the radio and stuff. But you you have a great quote, um, and the quote is: "You can't be a modest soul." if you want to be a celebrity broadcaster and you can't be a saint if you want to remain one. And both of these are very true in your case. So in, in, we, we touched on it a bit earlier, but in 2016, you, you got fired. I, I thought it was you. I, you. I got it on one of your, well, yeah. I well, mean, if I said that, I don't remember saying it. I mean, it sounds quite profound when it's reported back to me. Okay. I'll, I'll, you've been I'll, quoted. I'll, I'll, let me, let me refrain that. You've been quoted as saying. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Must have come up in an interview. Okay, so your question is. So the question was just about the the the, the whole uh, tweet uh, debacle, um, and and uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that and and how you sort of dealt with that and and how you stood up for yourself in that situation? Yeah, I kind of already covered the ground, but I'm happy to go over it one more time. I mean, I'm I'm very aware that you guys have time constraints, and and I do too. Um, yeah. Basically, I, I I was in a engaged in a tweet battle that wasn't even mine. There was that woman, Penny Sparrow, who spoke about black people on the beaches and said they were monkeys. And Musi Maimani of the DA, in his response to this, to, in order to virtue signal that he was you know, against racism, which is a default position for anyone of any substance at all, uh, he decided that he needed to ask a question on Twitter about whether some kinds of speech should be illegal and outlawed. Now, we already have in our constitution a provision for hate speech which involves incitement. And I, I was upset that the, the leader of the major opposition party was, was of the position and of the opinion that we should outlaw some kind of speech just because it upset people. This is the first step towards autocracy. And it bothered me on some deep level. So I tweeted, I didn't think about it more than I thought about other things. And I tweeted saying, with the response to Musa Maimani, people really don't understand freedom of speech, which people took to mean that I thought Penny Sparrow's freedom of speech was being threatened and that I was in, in favor of racist speech. And obviously this is, mm. this is not a position I've ever occupied and my record will show as much. And Mnet said in the, in the wake of this, well, you know, we don't know whether we want you on idols this year. And I said to them, well, it's not going to work that way, mostly because I'd taken advice from, from Dalim Pofu, who'd been on my show that morning. And he said to me, if they fight with you, fight back. Um, and he's, a, you know, the, he's the chairman of the, the EFF, which is a radical left-wing party in South Africa. And he represented me in the end against Mnet and we won and I got reinstated on the show. But it was, a, it was about the contract effectively. They'd already signed a contract with me. And then I went on the show and then later that year resigned and um, left on a high on my own terms rather than on their terms. Hmm. And it's just, Thanks for sharing that. This is important to clarify like, you know, what the story is and, and how important it is to stand up for, for hmm. your principles. Well, also, you can't, you know, if, if a massive media organization like, like DSTV and Mnet were willing to be pushed around by a couple of noisy people in the Twitter sphere, that, that's a weakness that you, you, if you mean to do something important and you mean to make a contribution, you can't let people who are supposedly meant to be more responsible than you for defending free speech neglect their duty and, and make you the victim, make you the... Because they, I mean, all of these media businesses now offer up a sacrifice of, oh, well, there was this journalist who did this, or was this person who did that. And 
and they, they're willing to have these people burnt like witches at the stake in order to keep themselves clean. Mm. And it's not acceptable. It, if, you've got to have some gumption and some strength of character and stand up for things that matter. Yeah. Totally, Gareth. And, and don't you feel like the world, at least politically, seems to be lacking good leadership? Uh, they, they, I don't know, like, it, it's very hard to find, like, some, some really good ones at the moment, at least at the helm, do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. I don't know. I think people have always said this, because people, that we've all got a, a, an idea in our heads that someone's going to save us. I don't think it's ever been like that. I don't think people in World War II all loved Winston Churchill. Mm. I think, you know, the circumstances of the time made him a great leader. But he was outvoted just two years after winning World War II. Um, he was outvoted by the same people who needed him during World War II. People are, we, we, we're looking for a Jesus. We all want some magic solution to the problem. And it, it doesn't exist because humans are not superhumans. They're humans. As a result, we're disappointing. And sometimes we don't deliver the goods when we're put under pressure. I don't know what kind of a leader we think we, we should have, but there doesn't exist such a creature. Mm. It is up to you. You can only be responsible for yourself. And you can try to make the world a little bit better by doing something useful, helping someone else, paying attention. There's no, there's no magic leader who's going to be born, and, you know, the, the King Solomon of, of, the, of the Bible who will come and, you know, figure out everything and has a wisdom that only God can, can possibly have given him. It doesn't exist. Humans. That's true. Yeah, we often talk about that with your health as well, you know, that you have to take care of yourself and have some understanding of your own world first to, to help others. But if, well, you, this if is, you could... This is an interesting thing you bring up because it, it makes me think of something that I had an argument with someone about once before. Someone said, well, it seems unfair to them that these people have money and those people don't, or these people have, um, you know, privilege or whatever you want to call it, and these people don't. And I said to them, you know, no one else can go to the gym and exercise for you. You have to do it for yourself. And of course, some of us are born with genetic advantages. Some of us are born with disadvantages. I, I, I have only been going to gym and training for maybe the last six or seven years. And I've started to look like something as opposed to like a giraffe or a stick <laughs> insect or a witch. And, and I think that that's taught me an enormous amount about how you have to, no matter what you come from, what you look like when you start off, you can improve that, but only you can. Mm -hmm. It's the same with money. It's the same with your relationships. It's the same with your health. All of these things are up to you and only you. Yeah. 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 100%. <laughs> like, and I think this is another thing which, um, which people don't maybe realize and don't definitely do enough of is just take responsibility, take responsibility for every single thing in your life, because th that's the only way. Do you know what I mean? Um, and then also you've got actually no one to blame besides yourself. Um, but it's weird. People don't want to take responsibility. Um, I don't know. Like, oh, yeah, I always see it. Like, you know, you, you, you pass something on, no, no, cool. You sort this out or you sort that out. Uh, it's just weird how we don't. Well, they, they don't, but, they, but deep down, they really do. I mean, they, they don't want the work, but there is nothing more fulfilling than being given a responsibility and delivering on it for everybody, whether you're a father, a son, a brother, a sister, an aunt, an uncle, a, a, a mom. There are things that when you have your responsibility and you live up to them, I suppose that make people feel very fulfilled. And I think that's what you're hinting at, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, in in a way, yeah, definitely. But but also like, yeah, I guess so. Um, you you're good there, bud. <laughs> no, no, I'm I'm good. I'm just Rena. Rena's pointing out to me. We've got a meeting that we've got to get to just now. So I I think an hour oh, and okay. a half. Yeah, I got to. Okay. okay. All right. Cool, bud. Cool. We 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 were in show. Cool. So let's so let's um finish off then, my my man. We just cool. wanted to, um, yeah, just ask. I guess our last question. Um, we, we we'll just say so, you know. Well, first of all, maybe you wanted to tell people where they can sort of get hold of you um online uh, or... best best thing to do is cliffcentral.com but wherever you listen to podcasts we do a, a, a daily podcast five days a week which is kind of current affairs and some commentary and some funny stuff 
But there are, there are obviously the social media channels that you can get me on too, um, at Gareth Cliff on Twitter, um, Instagram is GR Cliff and wherever else you want to find me. Cool. It's not amazing. Hard. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and but just our last question is, um, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Uh, I, I, there, there's so many answers to that question. Um, it, it, it's, that's tough because you're putting all the responsibility on me. And if you want to ask good questions or if you want good answers, you have to ask good questions. I'm not sure I can answer that satisfactorily. I, I love being alive. I love being curious. I love learning about the world. I am interested in meeting interesting people and having interesting conversations. And I do believe we're alive at the best possible time for all of those things to be ticked. Um, there are going to be things that we will deal with that nobody else has dealt with before, but I'm confident that humanity is in a very good position. And I, I like being me and I like being around now. Yeah, cool. Totally agree. That's, that's so perfect, bud. Um, yeah, I just want, just briefly wanted to say, like, serious, massive thanks for coming on our podcast. It's sure. a, it's Thank a real you. privilege uh, speaking to you. And, and it's, it's just so great speaking to someone who is super smart, who is not afraid to, to say what they think, and uh, who, who just gives a different perspective on the world. And um, I think, like you said, it, it's so important to have these conversations and to engage in um, debates and things that are topical. And also just thank you for you, but uh, you've, you've had such a big influence on, um, on so many people and on us and what you do every single day by having these conversations, by having these podcasts and everything is just hugely beneficial for every single person. And um, just, uh, yeah, just thanks again, man. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cool. Thanks. Right. Cheers, Gareth. Thanks Cheers, a lot. Thank you. Thanks so thanks, much, buddy. guys. Appreciate it. I'll send you, you this recording. All right. All right, bud. All thanks right, a lot, mate. man. Thanks a lot. Good Take stuff. care, man. Thank you. Take care, Cheers, bud. Bye, bye, bye. Bye. Making a dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging.